It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Mark E. Scott. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hi, Doug. How are you? I'm oh, doing fine. Thank you. I'm doing good. Thank you for coming good. on the show. So I see two books here, uh, Drunk Log and First Date. Are these connected? I mean, is it a series? It is a series. The, there is a third book that will be out um, before the end of the year, most likely. Drunk Log is number one, first date is number two, and then the last one is called Free Will, at least so far. Okay. Um, I'm looking at your bio. It looks like you've done a whole lot of things. Uh, you were in the Navy, and you've been, what else have you been doing, a banker? Yeah, mostly banking for the last 20 years or so. Okay. Why did you decide to write yeah. books? Um, you know, I, I, I started writing when I was about eight. And um, I tried writing my first book when I was about 15. So it's just been a, been a thing I've been at for, uh, you know, a number of, a good number of years. And completed my first book in early 90s. And then I wrote another one and then didn't write for about 15 years and got back on it about 10 years ago. The books you're looking at are some of the most recent, just the most recent ones that I've written. Okay, so these books are not the ones you started when you were eight years old. No, no, no. I'm sure I was a kid genius, though, you know, but <laughs> it would have been amazing. <laughs> uh, why don't you give us a little bit of an idea of what, what these books are like? And uh, don't give everything away because we want people to buy the books after all. But just do like a yes, sort of do. movie trailer of the book series, an overview of kind of what people can expect? Okay, well, Drunk Log itself, the first book is uh, each, I'll say this, each book is eight hours of a 24-hour period. So Drunk Log is the first eight hours. It runs from four in the afternoon till midnight. Uh, first date is midnight to eight in the morning, and then the last book will be eight in the morning till four in the afternoon. So the, the series itself is called A Day in the Life because all, all, the story is told over a 24-hour period. And uh, Drunk Log is, starts off as the story of a 30-year-old engineer who's responsible for the death of his 7-year-old nephew. And about, about a year after the accident, he decides he can't stand the guilt of it or the weight of it anymore. And he's going to decide he's going to kill himself. But before he does that, He's going to get drunk and write about it in the notebook. And in the notebook, he remembers his nephew. He writes about what he's thinking in the moment. Uh, he writes about his own history with, with his family and, and all of that. And at the end of the book, and throughout that book, a bartender named Arya is trying to track him down because she suspects that he's going to do something bad to himself. And she aims to prevent that from happening. So she their stories finally meet up at the very end of the book. And then in book two, their, their story is the same story. They, they both start together rather than separately, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, okay. So he's the bartender and him sort of uh, hook up and go out. That's the first date. Correct. Okay. Well, that, 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 yeah. that's... The ironic way I'm referring to it, yes. Oh, all right. Okay. Not, not much of a date, really. Well, where did this story come from? Is is there any of this that is rooted in reality? Did any of this happen to you, or is it just pure fiction? It's it's fiction. The, the story itself I got from a friend as we were hiking Pikes Peak. She was telling me about how um, she wanted to re have a have a record of everything she felt while she was getting drunk on a Friday night. So she bought a notebook, went to the bar in Athens, Ohio, and after every drink she would record her reaction, how she felt at that point, 
and perhaps any differences from the drink before it. Uh, she happened to be a scientist, so it, it was all very scientific. And when she told me the story, I thought, <laughs> that's incredible. Can I, can I use that in a book? And she said, sure. So that, that became the overlay for the main character's behavior. Okay. Are, are you self-published, or did a publisher pick up your, your books? Uh, th- these are traditional publishing. Traditional publishing. The publisher is called a, a regular publisher. They, they are not self-published, if that answers your question. Okay. Did you have to submit? I, the reason I ask this is because we do get a lot of first-time authors and authors, generally oh. speaking, listening to the show. And the publishing world can be very daunting for people. And <laughs> so I wanted to get your experience with publishing. So did you... You decided straight away that you weren't going to do these on your own, that you were just going to submit them in the traditional way and hope somebody liked them and wanted to uh, to publish them? Yeah. Oh, my God. That's, that describes it perfectly. When I, when I finished my first book way back in 1994, there was no such thing as, well, not, not as it is now, not since Amazon. There, there really wasn't a self-publishing you know, industry. Okay. You could, but I think essentially back then, you probably bought all the books yourself and then tried to sell them. So uh, that was the mode I was in. Um, I, that first book, I, back then, you know, there was no electronic copies. You sent out everything as a paper manuscript. Right. Uh, You corresponded by, you know, snail mail. And, and everything, you know, everything was on a delay compared to now. So, you know, over the period of about six months, the first time I tried getting published and finding an agent simultaneously because life gets easier with an agent, the, uh, I probably received somewhere between 25 and 30 rejection letters for my first book. (laughs) So I went back to the drawing board and wrote another one and then got a bunch of rejection letters (laughs) for that one too. But yeah, it is daunting because you're sort of throwing darts at a dartboard that you can't see. That's true. Um, yeah. The best explanation I ever heard was uh, an, an editor who, who worked with me on Drunk Log. You know, he said, "You know, Mark, you got to you got to remind yourself that uh, acquisition editors and agents they, they're in it to make money. Also, they're they're trying to earn a living. They want to get promoted. They want to do well." And you can only take so many chances on a new author every year. And, and maybe they have a quota. Maybe, maybe they go, hey, you know what? We'll try five new authors this year. And your book t- came in number six or 10. It, it is very hit or miss. And it can, it, it can be, gr- it's very grueling to query, even now. Even, you know, with, there's such a thing called query tracker and agents list their information on that but still there you know the great thing about electronics is you get the quick turn down now daunting is a good word for it do you have other books published besides these two no i actually well uh, there i do have a book called burning buildings which is actually self-published and that came out before these two and at the time with burning buildings i actually did have an agent and even with her we could not we could not find a a publisher for burning buildings. She, her advice to me was self-publish burning buildings and write another book. And that book was Trunk Log. Okay, well, it's interesting that, that you have an agent as well because agents oftentimes need to be sold on the book as much as the publisher is. Uh, very much so, yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's, yeah. I, I agree. It's It's like a layer of critique that you know if, if they don't like it they're going to tell you now, that's why it can be very difficult to find an agent as well well my point being is that because i haven't read your book but the point is that it must be fairly decent because if the agent likes it they're going to stand behind you and shop it and typically if they're a good agent they have good connections that can get you in the door because most traditional publishers, at least the big ones in New York, won't take unsolicited books at all. It ha- it almost has True. to come through an agent that they've worked with that they know. It would be very rare that they take 
a cold book out of nowhere and say, oh, my God, you know, this is the next Gone with the Wind. That doesn't <laughs> no, happen very often. That, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I can't, I'm trying to think off the top of my head of the big, how many big publishers are on a three? Well, Do there's five. Combining? Yeah, there's Random six, House. Five. Okay. Random House, Simon & Schuster, uh, Penguin, uh, and the other two I can't remember right, right off the yeah. top of my head. Those are the ones that I that come to mind. Yeah, I, I she ended up placing me with a with a boutique publisher, who I enjoy also because they're very personal. <laughs> but uh, to even then, the the word I got back was we will publish this if you turn it into a series. Ah, okay. Well, that's the other thing. They like series. <laughs> They, they like They that. do. Well, there's yeah. a, go ahead, Doug. No, um, I, that was it. I just was saying that publishers <laughs> typically like series. Well, it's, 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 it's economics and psychology. You know, if you buy, let, let's say you go buy First Date and you like it, you're probably going to go, hey, maybe I want to know what happens beforehand or, or after that. In their thinking and their experience, you should always sell more the first book than the ones that come after. Because people always go back and want to read the first one as a foundation to the story. Right. Well, it's it's business that, that can be applied to just about any product. You know, and Agreed. They like rinse and repeat. If it's sold great the first time, give us another one and, and don't change it too much. So you tend to see authors stick with a particular genre, which can be fine to a point. But then... As the author, as the creator, you get a little bit bored. And some people like to branch out and they like to reinvent themselves. And that tends to scare the publishers because then it's like starting over again with a new author. Unless you're really well established as a name to where you can just sort of do whatever you want. And I mean that holds sort of true. Like James Patterson writing children's books. Yeah, James Patterson writing children's book, and even like Stephen King, there was a point where he changed his name. He used a different name so he could write something else, and everybody knew it was him. So it didn't work. Right, and I think I think it was sort of a, a personal bet with himself that to see if he could. People didn't know who actually wrote the book. You know, he was an un unknown author if it would sell the way a Stephen King book would but it, as you pointed out it didn't work because everybody knew it was him already yeah because his style is so distinctive that there was just not a yeah. chance he could hide it you know and that that holds true with anything with any product I mean do you remember when Coca-Cola tried to change the formula a little bit back in the 90s so. and people went nuts <laughs> well you know what? People get plenty of change in their lives. They don't want it all to change at once. The thing about, and that's the thing about the series too, is it gives people a chance to know the author. So, you know, I've got some books on the back burner that will come out either before book three comes out or right after. And hopefully at that point, and, and they're, they're single, they're single books. It's, they're not series, but hopefully, you know, people who've read, my books and like it will go, you know what? I like that guy. And, uh, I'll give, I'll give him a, give him a try, even though it's, you know, not in this series. So that's the idea. It's, as you pointed out, people get used to a certain product and they trust it over and over again. And if you mess with it, you know, they get upset. They get very upset. And in or fact, many of them do. I've seen with, with some very successful authors where the series just keeps going. You know, there's no set uh, number of books in a series. I've seen a series that uh, that has two books, and I've seen a series that has 25 books. So it yeah. it depends. But again, the, it's it's like the Coca-Cola thing, where the publishers will say, oh, well, this series is great. Do another one. Do another one. Do another one. And I know one author that has been on my show several times, where I think she's up to 14 or 15 in this series. And it's just been, <laughs> it's just been going on and on and on. And, and, you know, good for her. But uh, 
they, well, I mean, if you've yeah. got the formula and it's working, exactly. my, my, my genre, my style, not necessarily the my genre, but my style isn't such that I can repeat the, the pattern over and over again. Um, but who is the lady who wrote the uh, Alphabet Mysteries? And that's not the name of her thing, but she, she actually passed away uh, not, not too long ago. But she had, you know, A is for something... B is for something. Oh, I know yeah, the series. She was series, clearly going to but... max out at 26 books. <laughs> I know the series, <laughs> unless she went to the Cyrillic alphabet or something. Um, right. Double A is for aardvark. You know? Yeah, I don't remember her name, but I know the one you're talking but about. But you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So she she had a formula. It was the same detective over and over again. It was you know essentially a similar plot line. You know, you go. it's like any mystery show. You have or law and order or crime and punishment, you know, the, the, the archetype or every show that came after, as long as you're willing to stick to that and people like it. And clearly people did. You can sell a crap load of books. That's true. For better or worse, mm. you know, mine tend to be, you know, these three, the, these three books are the same main characters throughout. And then somebody did ask me, you know, well, Oh, do you think you could keep the series going? I'm like, I suppose if I marry, you know, marry them and go 10 years in the future, you know, now they're having kids, <laughs> but I don't, I don't know what I would do with that story. So, uh, so, so this yeah. one, this one you think is going to be three and that's it. Yeah. Cause it's, I trap myself by the name a day in the life and it is one, one day. I guess I could take a, 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 you know, a longer view and go, Oh, it's just a day. It's a new day. You know, <laughs> If I go to book number four or five and six, yeah. Okay. So it's a brand new day in the life of it. But uh, I, I don't foresee that. But who knows? Who knows what what I'll feel like doing. Well, there's a, there's a fine or balance. Allowed. There's a fine balance between intrigue and mystery and new concepts and beating a dead horse. So you want to make sure that, <laughs> that you don't cross the line there, which it can be a little bit gray, I think. We were talking about agents. You, uh -huh. can, you can get an agent for a book. You can get an agent if you're an actor, if you're a writer, if you're a musician. Uh, but there are no agents available for show hosts. That just doesn't exist. For podcasters. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's no such thing. And that would be a good job that I could probably make a fortune if I could figure out how to do that and represent – you know, various podcasts and try to sell them to, to Spotify, like, like Joe Rogan or something like that. But it it's really daunting. You know, I'll use that again to try to advertise podcasts. There's just not a, a great way to do it. So we haven't figured it well, out. I, yeah. Yeah. See that. And that's the thing. I'm a guy trying to sell bo books and who's heard of me? I mean, I, I think most people can probably name maybe five or ten li living authors off the top of their head. Yeah, yeah. that's about right. And then yeah. it's really, you know, for you too, for your podcast. I don't, know how, I don't know if you can even tell how many people listen to it. It's a little easier with books because, you know, the book gets sold. Oh, well, we get the um, stats. I mean, I, I can tell you we get between probably five and 10,000 depending on the guest. You know, if the guest is famous, oh, well, hopefully you'll get, they bring yeah. their own. If it's me, you'll get five or ten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny because all of the major podcasts, and then there's a handful, and the rest of them nobody knows, are, everybody did something else first. And that's what is interesting for me because they were already known. And... I've also noticed that with authors, the way that they become a lot more famous is if the book gets picked up and turned into a film. Um, and I actually, there's a gentleman who is who is going is looking into doing that for me now. He's well, a, good. He, he's a film agent in, yeah. in Hollywood. So. Because that is the best and, advertising for you you could ever get. And you get paid. Well, <laughs> And and see that that so then that's the question. How do you get noticed? You know how how do how do you gain 
an audience when I'm one guy essentially working by himself, you know, paying a PR firm to find people like you willing to put me on the air? Well, it's a great question, but, uh, and it's not one that's easily yeah. answered because I asked the question similarly to to David Baldacci, who I think you've probably heard of. He's been on this show yeah, three yeah. times. And he said that for the first 15 years of his writing, he wasn't making a dime. And he got lucky with, with Absolute Power, which got picked up and turned into a Hollywood feature. And that put him on the map. So it was exactly yeah. that. Yeah, no, I, you know? it's, I love, I'm, thank you for telling that story because I've been, if, if you start the beginning of my writing career with the self-publishing of Burning Buildings, which is a good book, you know, that was six years ago. So let's see, according to Baldacci, nine more years, I'll be famous. <laughs> if I follow the, if I follow the Baldacci method. Right, of, right. Which, but, but you do have to keep going. And, and yeah, if, you have do. Have you heard the, the, the 20 to the 20 for 50 theory? No, what's that? That if you, if you can get 20 books out there, you can... On average, you could earn, you know, you'll essentially earn 50 grand a year because you'll have enough books and people will just buy you. Um, but, but yeah, that's, okay. you know, yeah, I don't know if I agree with that. It's a theory. Yeah. Nobody's proven it to me. Okay. Well, you <laughs> know, I, I, I get, I get, I get pissy with my local bookstore because I, I went over to, they, they stocked my book and they put it on because it's an alphabetical order in the local section. It's on the bottom shelf of this big, tall wall sh wall shelf, and you almost had to crawl under another table to get to my book. Oh. And I went in there like, "Hey, can I show you guys something?" I said, "I, I don't think we're we're going to sell that many books." And they're like, "How come?" I said, "Well, who's going to see this?" And, and they said, "Well, it's in alphabetical order." I said, "Well, <laughs> let me oh, tell oh, you, change your name <laughs> then." I, I have a, yeah yeah, and I'll change it to Aaron Heck. Aaron, Aaron Aardvark. with an A. Yeah, Aaron Aardvark. <laughs> but but I I said uh, I said first of all, is there any way I can get out of the local section? I said, do you think that um, bookstores in Bangor, Maine, stick Stephen King in the local section? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm not comparing my sales to Stephen King, but you got to give me a chance to for people. People aren't going to now. I have great. I, I love the artwork. I love the artist, the publisher hired. That's one of the great things about having a publisher too. You know, they, they're they're fronting money for all that crap. Right. And, uh, right. And, and and if you walk by, because of the artwork, if you walk by my book, you're going to notice it. It is. It looks vastly different than most books I see on bookshelves. So the new book is called First Date. Is it is out now? Yeah, it came out at the end of May. End of May, okay. And how is it doing? Uh, you know, I, I check. Uh, I was advised not to do this, but I do check my standing on Amazon. It's still doing good, um, standing wise. I I I think it it started off stronger. I, I think sales wise, it started off stronger than the first book, which is as it should be. And because, um, you know, who who knows you when you only have one book out there. So, yeah, we'll see. I, I, I continue. The marketing efforts continue, put it that way. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> Mark, we do have to wind this down. We're running out of time. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. Do you have a website that you want to give out? It's markescottauthor.com. Okay. And there's information about the book there. Are there links to buy the book from the website? There are links to Amazon and to Barnes & Noble through okay. that website. Well, thanks for coming on the show. It was nice meeting you, nice talking to you, and uh, best of luck. Thank you, Doug. Have a great day. <laughs>